board. Okay, double zeros on the dot. Um, we're getting started here. Welcome uh, to today's uh, webinar on direct <coughs> mail marketing and some really great strategies that can help you and an awesome potential vendor. Uh, before we introduce our special guest, just going over some housekeeping, uh, please feel free to chat uh, questions or use the q and I'll have them both pulled up. But as Todd's presenting, Craig's discussing things, I'm chiming in. If you have questions or things, go ahead and submit them. In fact, I prefer the Q&A, <clears throat> actually. I changed my mind. So don't chat questions. Use the Q&A. That way I can moderate them. I can like mark them answered yeah. or whatever. Um, so go ahead and submit them all throughout the call. Um, I am recording this webinar. We'll have it on the CWC platform this afternoon in the recorded webinars course. So if you have to jump off or something, the recorded webinars for owners course. Right. I'm going to put this in that one. So if you need to jump off, it's cool. I'll have it up tonight. Um, so you can look at it tomorrow or whatever. Um, so that's the housekeeping. Thank you guys for jumping on. I know you've got a lot going on um, to finish this month strong. And I appreciate you guys for jumping on. I'll pass it to Craig. Yeah, look, thanks so much for being on the call today, guys. Really appreciate it. And honestly, we've been really excited about this particular topic and looking forward to this webinar for, for a long time. You know, lead generation is always one of those big topics. Everybody wants to know where do I get more leads? How do I generate more leads? And I'll just be honest with you, man. A lot of the stuff that we've done over the last several years, it's just getting harder and harder, whether it's reaching out to people on the phone, you know, the whole issue with texting, um, email marketing, a lot of those things, you know, it's, it's just getting more complicated. Consumers aren't responding to it as well. And it's, it's just not working like it used to a lot. It's still effective. We still do a lot of that stuff. Um, but it's just it maybe a little bit more difficult than it used to be. Now, direct mail is one of those things that's old school that, you know, that I did back 20 something years ago when I started that now seems to be making a comeback mm -hmm. because, you know, it's just a lot easier to execute. Um, and people are calling you instead of you calling them. And there's some challenges of that, which we'll talk about today. Uh, so we wanted to talk about this. A lot of people are really interested and direct mail and how do you do it and I think it's important that you do it the right way we've worked with a lot of people who have tried direct mail and if you don't know what you're doing if you don't pay attention to the details you don't execute on it correctly you'll just end up wasting a bunch of money mm -hmm. so we wanted to have this conversation today and I brought in Todd McLean to talk to you guys and, and have this conversation Todd is the number one farmers agent in the state of Texas um, which says a lot. There's a lot of farmers agents te in Texas. He's ranked number one. Okay. And his business centers primarily around direct mail. Um, he's been right. so successful with it. In fact, that he started his own company to help other people with direct mail. And, and he's got, you know, some things to talk about with that today. Um, but he started as an agent, you know, just, just like all of us did and is now reaching out to help other people execute on this. And he's learned a lot through the process, you know, as have we, uh, so, what I wanted to do is just bring him on and let him kind of talk with you guys and explain the do's and the don'ts and maybe some of the rationale, some of the reasoning about how you put the letters together, where you place things, you know, filtering, all those kind of things, because this can get really expensive. Direct mail, it can, it can be a lot of money, you know, just like warm transfers and internet leads and all the other stuff that we're doing and have done for years, you know, that's expensive too. Um, you need to do this the right way. Otherwise you're just kind of, throwing your money away. So it's really important sure. that you pay attention to the details. So Todd, I appreciate you being on the call with us today. Absolutely. Some time. Um, I know you've got you know, a presentation put together to kind of walk everybody through some of these points. Um, yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to you and, and, and let you take it and, uh, and go through this with everybody. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll discuss it when you get finished up. Sure. So uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, even if you don't decide to go, my route or, you know, I want to give away all the things that it took me 10 years to figure out, right? Um, so if I back up to when I first started doing direct mail, I was using another vendor and it worked to a certain extent. I never got the ROI I needed. Um, and what I noticed was most of the vendors that are out there are from print shops who's never been an insurance agent before, right? So not only do they not understand the underwriting variables and things going on in the economy or in the local markets or things like that, I struggled for a long time using those companies and jumped around a lot. 
because they didn't know what I needed to, they didn't, they've never sat in my shoes. You know what I mean? So um, what I wanted to do here is kind of start from the basics, the beginning, and just go through kind of the evolution of how I started it myself um, to kind of give some insights. So this first slide, you know, back to the basics, this might be common sense to everybody, um, but let's go through the different kinds of direct mail that there are. So you have, I don't know if anybody's heard of every door direct mail through USPS, mm -hmm. a very cheap option um, of mailing through USPS. The big problem with that is that there's no targeting. So you pick a mailing route and you blast everybody in that mailing route. And one of the things that I preach is efficiencies. So I don't want to use that personally. You might have a different motive. Uh, but for me, if I mail out 10,000 to a certain mailing route, then I'm gonna have a lot of people calling me that aren't gonna meet my underwriting um, requirements or filters that I want. And so now I'm gonna have my staff quoting people I shouldn't be quoting and it gets in the way of me converting people. Um, so that's one type, you can look into it. If you have a type of product that you want to hustle to everybody in a certain zip code, every door direct mail is the cheapest way to do it, right? Um, postcards, again, really cheap. One thing that you can do is you can filter by your own list with postcards, which that's a really good. Uh, but the problem that we've found, and I've had professional marketing companies uh, go over this with me and I'm going to show you some insight into what those professionals gave me um, but consumers only give half the attention span to a postcard that they do a direct mail piece mm -hmm. and the reason is and what I'm told and you can kind of think it for yourself is they view a postcard as junk mail from the straight start if that makes sense like I see a postcard I know it's junk right? Unless it's a picture of my family from a vacation, <laughs> I know that I know it's junk. So what happens with it is you get one to two seconds, maybe one second of a glance. And if you don't have a call to action that speaks loudly to them, it is immediately going in the trash can, right? So that being the case, if you have an amazing, um, amazing call to action, postcards can work. It's just the likelihood of them working is a lot different. Uh, when we tested it, we had 50% less response rate on postcards than we did on the direct mail piece itself. So then you have the standard first class mail. This is where a lot of agents will do their own in-house marketing. They'll buy their own print setup, and you know it's a lot more expensive, but you can get twice that contact rate than you can from postcards. Handwritten or printing, um, a lot of people will handwrite quotes or handwrite the, the envelope. I do believe that you get a much higher response rate. The only problem is the time that it takes to do all of that. So it's not really a scalable event. And then your open rate, um, which I'll get into in just a minute, is highly dependent on your call to action and the visual of the envelope itself. And what I mean by that is if you have an envelope, and I actually, um, I have an example that came to my house from Allstate. <laughs> okay, right. so you guys know corporate, you know, mail is corporate mail. It's it's not a good call to action. It's not. There's nothing eye catching. I know this is junk. You get what I mean? So anything that looks like junk is going to be treated like junk, which is the same one second that you get from a postcard. And so you have to be really careful if you're going to go the direct mail route that you know what you're looking at and you know that your piece is going to get the open rate. Um, then you also have what's called SCF mail drops. And so what an, a bulk SCF mail drop is, is when you go through a vendor, we have access to bulk print jobs and different rates than your standard 47 cent stamp. For example, I can use a stamp and get the, uh, the postage down to, you know, two thirds of that cost because I'm sending through bulk, right? So if you're gonna do this yourself in-house and print 50,000 mailers in-house, make sure you go get an SCF um, and, and bulk, um, I'm losing the, the terminology in my head, but you can get bulk rates through USPS. And I wanted to go over a couple of mistakes that I see most people make with direct mail. The biggest mistake by far is mail fatigue. 
And so what mail fatigue is, is an agent will send out the same mail piece because they think it's awesome, right? And they get really good return rates on it. They get tons of people calling them. And then after a year, it just starts to die. And the agent's sitting there going, what is going on? Why, why am I not getting the phone calls that I used to get? And if you think about it, it's completely due to the fact that the, the consumer that you're mailing to, again, if you're doing X dates or if you're selling the, you know, sending the same person two or three times a year, they know it's junk, right? So if you're not constantly refreshing your mail piece every 12 months at a minimum, then your contact rate is going to die because of mail fatigue. So that's the biggest one that I've found. Then the other one is core filters, where agents will, will not filter their list properly and it gets them the contact rate that they want, but they're hitting the wrong target audience. And so this is a double-edged sword. And let me explain what I mean. So for example, if you want to get a lot of wealthy people calling you, you want high preferred customers, right? The, the cream of the crop people, guess what? A teaser saying you can save 200 bucks is not going to entice them very often. So your contact rate, the, the higher quality you go, the more contact or the less contact rate you'll get because those are more fluent people, not, not really moved too often by a teaser. Then you have the flip side where you might say, okay, let's open up these, uh, these filters and, and we don't care about income levels. We don't care about the home value. We just want the homeowners and next dates. You're going to get a big increase in your contact rate. And I would do that if you're in an area that's just killing it with rate, right? You are competitive as hell. Open that floodgate up, right? But it's a balancing act. So that's something that I really stress with agents and we work through is, okay, did you get enough contact rate? No, I didn't. Okay, your filters are really strict, but let's loosen them up a notch get some more coming in, right? And, and so you really have to play with your filters and that's where you do have to invest some money in a learning curve and making sure you're getting the right people through your front door. Or over so your Todd, let me ask you about that. Just kind of stop you right there on the, on the filters. Um, can you give everybody an idea of what kind of filters maybe you would recommend starting out with as they're, as they're yeah. designing this? Um, so we have another slide about filters that's coming up in a little bit. Um, should I just hit it now? You think? Yeah. If, if you got in another slide, that's fine. We can hit yeah. it. Then. That's no problem at all. Sure. So yeah, I'll definitely get into, uh, to filters. And then, um, so the next point that I, I find agents making mistakes is the timing of the mail drops. So just as a tip, we, we like to do X dating. I know some agents, you know, don't really worry about X dating. For me, I like X dating. Um, and I like to drop the mail on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. So we found that a Tuesday or Wednesday has the best contact rate if we can hit those days. So then we also found a lot of agents don't use custom local phone numbers and they'll use their phone number and they, they think they're tracking the right thing. But a lot of times people call after hours when no one's around and they don't leave a voicemail. So if you're not tracking your after hours phone calls, seeing did anybody call that phone line, you could be missing out on about a third of your contact rate. So it's a big metric. And then the other thing that people don't do, if they, um, a lot of agents on the ECP contractor, they just go nuts and send out a hundred thousand mail pieces, which by the way, I love. Um, <laughs> but if you're mailing out a lot in a huge radius, you can actually buy multiple phone numbers with a local area code so that you feel local, right? So make sure if you're going to cast a really wide net and invest heavily in direct mail, that you want when they open up that mail piece to feel like you're local and then in the phone number area code the biggest way to do that because trust me a lot of times they don't even look at the address of the agent they're looking at the call to action they're looking at the phone number that you're local and then they're calling you and i'll go through that um, in our design and then mailing out small volume so it, like anything with marketing it's a law of averages so I never recommend any agent getting into a direct mail unless you can send out 3,000 mail pieces a month because if your contact rate is a half a percent, let's say, and you get 15 phone calls off 3,000, if you only send out 1,000, you might get one and a half phone call or maybe one. And you just can't make that work. Versus if you got 3,000 sent out and you got 15 phone calls, 
there's a good chance that out of those 15 households, if you're filtering properly, you have some big affluent clients that you can get a lot of revenue from. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, so those are the mistakes that I see people make. And I really want to give, give some attention now to design of the mail piece. This was one of my biggest mistakes going into direct mail my first couple of years. So the first couple of years, I thought, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if I came up with a mail piece? And I thought I had the best mail piece ever. Just going, oh, this is so cool. The call to action is simple. Unfortunately, I don't have any examples of what I had in the past, but it really looked like a corporate mail piece. And you can buy this technology. I don't think it's cheap. But anytime, every time we come up with a new mail piece for our, our company, we're always running it through a heat map of visuals, which means when a consumer looks at your mail piece, it's gonna show where their eyes are gonna focus on. And if it's not focused on your call to action and relevance to them, they're gonna throw it away. And so whenever we run it through this program, you can see that the, they're clearly noticing their name, they're clearly noticing your price, twice and then make them relevant and friendly your, your photos on there with a call to action. So I would say if you're going to do this yourself and you're going to invest a lot of money in equipment and machinery, you need to spend a lot of time with a professional marketing company who's going to show you if your letter is going to be successful or not based on visual cues. So big corporations use this technology all the time anytime they send out a mail piece. So you really need to make sure your art I call it the art of the art is, um, is on point. Anything that doesn't have what we notice, notice how all of this text, a lot of people, salespeople especially get really wordy, right? And, and type a lot of words out. Most consumers will not read your text because they're only going to give you four to five seconds, mm -hmm. right? So make sure your visual cues are on point in those four to five seconds and visible clearly your call to actions or they will not respond. Um, here's an example of how we construct the envelope. The envelope is the key to your open rate. And so what you're looking at now is our first version of this last envelope that we did. Clear indication, we use an image. Um, so you can get Google Maps has uh, the ability to get the image of the house, which is where the eye for the consumer is gonna look at and it catches their eye immediately versus, um, where did I go? So versus your, your envelope like this that has the name of Allstate, which is what they would look at. <laughs> I like using this as an example. I uh, know you do. Um, <laughs> we got billion dollar company, right? Um, <laughs> That's, that's what the, their eyes going to go to. And if they don't have all state, they're not going to open it. Right. Unless at that exact moment, they wanted to shop for insurance. So the visual cue, getting them looking at the image of their house, that makes it very personable. Like, what is this? It's different. I know a lot of companies use uh, now the image of the house. It's still effective. And then they're also looking at your renewal notice. Well, what we found through some uh, research was that the envelope after our first run wasn't getting the contact rate we wanted. So we went back to our, our uh, professional marketing company and they said, you know what, it's not unique enough. So what we did was we created a new envelope, changed it from blue to red to catch their eye, and then we put a real stamp on the front. Mm -hmm. And so that what that did is made it look a lot different than everything else that's postmarked, right? And it makes it feel like, hey, my house is on here, a renewal notice, what's this? So that's some examples of how we look and identify, you know, how we're going to have success or not inside our, our mail pieces. And we redo our um, mail pieces. We're coming up on our next versions. Um, and... Uh, we can share some examples too. One thing we'll, we will not do though is anytime we come out with a new mail piece, I won't share that because it's, it's kind of our secret, right? It's our secret sauce until it becomes outdated. Then we'll show it all day long.
Um, here we go. Here's the, you had asked me, Craig, about the filters. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so filtering to the right prospects is extremely important. And I know uh, you guys with Allstate get a huge discount at Sales Genie. I, I end up spending about 30 grand a year in Sales Genie. And I think you guys get it 800 bucks. Or it's wow. just ridiculously, I'm jealous. Um, the, the filters though, when I was talking about, hey, how you really wanna focus on how competitive you are in your area for what type of prospect, what type of consumer. And some of my favorite filters would be a consumer age range. In my area specifically, there's some places where I can't sell auto insurance if you're over 70. Just not even close to competitive. If that's not your case, then you wouldn't use an age range. Or unless you want to say, you know what, I don't want anybody under 25 because of their auto rates. If, you know, Geico or Progressive is beating you on teenagers, whatever the case may be. Income range is one of those that you have to be very careful with. Because if the more affluent you're going after, the more likely your contact rate's gonna drop, right? So what I recommend is if you're in a very dense populated area and you have a l millions of people around you and you have a wide gap of lower income versus upper income and just complete opposite neighborhoods, income would be a good way to start as a baseline, let's say at $50,000 so that you at least know you're filtering out a certain segment where you're going to get better credit scores, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, home value, it's an obvious one, better the house. A lot of people, notice how I didn't put on here the age of the house. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like to stress, uh, and I know underwriting, the age of the home is pretty important, right? But for me, uh, depending on your market, for me, I would much rather target older homes if their value was higher because I still want a chance at quoting it because for more affluent people living in a really nice uh, metro area where those homes might have been built in the 50s and 60s, but it's a million dollar house, why would I not want to target those people, right? So there's so many product ranges that I can offer them versus somebody who has a 1990s home that's worth 200 grand who, you know, is not going to have the same kind of umbrella, life insurance, uh, VULs, all sorts of retirement products. So you have to be very careful when it comes to age of the home versus value of the home. And then I like doing biannual X dates. And what I mean by that is a lot of people X date, but what they don't recognize is if somebody bought a home two years ago, three years ago, and you keep X dating the same X date, there's a good chance that they switched their policies when they're auto renewed, which is typically on a six month basis. And when they switch their auto, they probably switch their home. And so after a couple of years, if you're not doing, um, you know, for example, this next mail run we're sending out, I'm sending out November and this are December and June. So now I'm hitting people that sure the June people, if it's December X date, there's some in the June that that's not really their X date, but their auto is probably renewing as well. So I'm hitting it two times of the year where I have more likelihood of contact rate. Then um, a lot of all state agents that we help out, they use their market opportunity report to find the top closing ratios. You just have to be really careful. I've seen a lot of agents send me over the zip codes that they want with, uh, with, some insight into that intelligence. And, you know, they send me a zip code that has a 50% close rate and saying, Hey, it's awesome. But they have two quotes, <laughs> right? So definitely if you're going to play with those, be mindful of false data is what I call it. Don't just mail to a zip code because you, um, because it has a high close rate, make sure you look at the number of quotes to see if that data is accurate or not. And I already mentioned about over filtering. So, uh, let's see. Should we answer some Q and A's or I feel like I'm. No, you're good. Keep going. We'll get, we'll yeah. get to the Q and A at the end. <laughs> okay. Give me a second. So, um, one of the big things that CWC helps out with, right. Is coaching, training, talk paths. One of the things that, um, I wanted to help agents out with is the teaser rate. 
a lot of agents that do direct mail with us, even my own staff, I had to teach them how do you overcome the, the, the teaser rate on the mail piece because it's a teaser for a reason, right? Not everyone's going to qualify for that rate. So here's the talk path that we use and it works like a charm. Granted, you still have those people that I want this price, right? Those, you're going to get that 10, 15% of the time, no matter what. But here's the talk path to overcome it the rest of the time. First, we say, hey, uh, you know, somebody's calling me in for, uh, I saw this uh, rate on this mail piece. We say, thank you. We'd love to give you the opportunity. Uh, we'd love the opportunity to quote your home. What's your address? So we're looking up, up in our system. And then we say, the mailer rate you are seeing is the best possible pricing we have in your area. What it might not be taking into consideration, though, is consumer reports and claims history that I can't pull without your consent. And we bring that up for very specific reasons because something else we will bring up if they, if they dive into it deeper is, you know, how they get, uh, everybody gets credit card offerings in the mail mm -hmm. as low as 9%, things like that, loan on your car. Well, they send you that rate because they can't pull your credit until you give them consent. So it's just kind of extra backup if you needed it. But then we jump straight into what I'd like to do is just ask, uh, you know, take a couple of minutes to ask you some more customized questions so we can protect your home properly and get you the best value I can. How old is the roof on your house? Right? So we jump straight into questioning for underwriting to get this flowing. And then something else we do is we talk about who they have now. I know a lot of agents don't want to bring price into the conversation, but this is a different beast. The price is what caused the conversation. That's right. Right. So if you're going to do direct mail, you just have to accept that fact, but there's a way to get around it. So what we do is we, um, we say, Hey, you know what, who's your current insurance company? And have you noticed your rates increasing with their insurance company? And the reason why you're doing that is you don't want to say, hey, your company sucks, but you try to get them to start a negative path because the next question we ask is, uh, you know, if they say that they notice their rates are increasing, we say, oh, no, that's no good. What are, you, what are they charging you now? And we don't say, how much are you paying? What are they costing you? We say, how much are they charging you? And charging is a very negative connotation to get people to open up to complain because people love to complain. <laughs> And, you know, if, even if they say, no, our rates haven't increased, we just say, that's good. What are they charging you now? So we use that to really amp up the close. And so what it would look like is once I find out if they will tell us, and typically we get it 70, 80% of the time, right? So there's still 20, 30% of the time people just won't disclose what it is unless you tell them. But when we find it out, what's really good is if they ever go back to the mailer rate, is if I'm better priced than the competition, it makes it really easy for me to say, but wait, like I had mentioned before, in your area, this is how we're competing and I'm beating your insurance company now with better coverage. And so we, we take away their firepower of the mailer rate because of the, the intro that we bring into it and then the close of competitiveness between them and their current insurance company. Right? Yeah, and that, that is such, go back, go back to that slide for a second, Todd, because this honestly is such a huge, you know, we work with, with agencies that they spend a lot of money on direct mail and they don't train well enough or they don't train everybody, meaning that there could be some people that are answering the phone that they didn't spend any time training and they don't know how to get that to a, to an agent or get, get a quote, and then they lose that opportunity. And you're looking at such a small percentage of response rate, you got to maximize every one of them. So this is something that you can't just hand people a sheet and say, hey, say this. You've got to train on it. You've got to role play on it. you got to make sure people are good at that and can pivot because a lot of your staff – you know, oh, they're going to be, this is going to be a, a, a difficult thing for them. They're, they're going to have some, some of them are going to have a difficult time overcoming that talk path or that objection or whatever you want, that conversation with that customer when they're calling and looking for that rate. And they're not really going to know how to handle it. And you, and you got to train them on it. You got to spend some time and make sure that everybody, whoever's answering the phone, whether they're selling or not, is well versed on this and can handle those calls coming in or you're just wasting your money. 
And then, of course, you got to train on the sales process, overcome objections, all the other things. But at least to get to the quote part, if you're not training your team, if you're not spending time with them and going over this and making sure they got it, where you role play it and it's really smooth, you're, you're going to waste a lot of money. No doubt about it. Absolutely. So um, I, we – should we answer some Q&A first or – you want to go tell ahead, them? Go ahead and show them the special offer you put together just for the CWC <laughs> members, and we'll dive into the questions. Yeah, um, so, you know, working with CWC, one of the things that I wanted to do is try to get you guys hooked up um, to where you could afford to do bulk yeah. mail. And so CWC members are going to save an extra two cents over our base price. And you might think, well, two cents isn't that much. Well, there's not a lot of margin in direct mail, right? Um, so with, with CWC members, they save two cents. And then something really cool for all state agents is I built in another savings, which is off sales genie. So if you work with our team on letting us download sales genie leads from your sales genie account, that saves me from paying 30 grand to them a year, um, in, in aggregate. So we're going to take total four cents off our, our mail price rates and you have our turnkey pricing over here on the right hand side. For agents who send out a lot of bulk mail, we actually will give additional discounts on every 10,000 mail pieces you send out, you get an extra one cent off. So we do have some agents that are sending out 50 to 100,000 mail pieces a month. If you're on that ECP contract and you're getting some huge numbers up front, uh, bonuses, there is no better way than just blow up direct mail and have your phones <coughs> having come in the easiest closes out of any marketing system that you can get, right? Cause they're calling you, you're talking to them asking, you know, they're asking you for a quote. It's a, uh, you know, our estimate from our numbers, we have a three times more likely to close a uh, direct mail piece than we will a live transfer call a three X, right? So it just becomes really simple. And to get more information on this deal, all you need to do is go to our website. It's marketing mail. So it, really this is an S marketingmail.com. And at the bottom is a contact form. Um, and we'll, we'll reach out to you. If you can fill out that contact form, yes, marketingmail.com and fill out the contact form and then we'll reach out to you. I promise we're not, I don't use any pipe drive or any solicitations like a, as an agent, I think that's annoying. So we won't spam you, um, but we'll reach out if you're interested and do more of a one-on-one -on -one to get you some uh, numbers on what's available in your area as far as volume. And, and, and just to be clear, before we get to the Q and A, you know, you don't have to use a vendor. If you want to do direct mail on your own, there's, there's a lot of people around the country that do that. And they go buy the equipment and they've got the people and, and they, they do it all in house. You know, we've, we've got some members that do that. Um, but if you don't want to, and you want to outsource that and let somebody handle it all, you know, I appreciate you putting that together for them, Todd. That's, that's helpful. Um, we're just trying to share as much information as we can. So you can do this, um, you know, by yourself. I think it's just, it's a lot easier if you let somebody else do it, but um, you can do direct mail on your own. If you like. But I appreciate you putting that together for everybody. That, that's, that's definitely helpful. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's go to some questions. We've got plenty. Um, so let's kind of fly through these. Uh, David asked if we could get a copy of the presentation via email. David, I actually just put the link in chat. Um, so if anybody wants to have a copy of this, there's some good, good talk pass there. Uh, and you can learn more at smarketingmail.com. Um, let's see here. So if you have a bulk mail permit, Alan wants to know, if you have a bulk mail permit, how do you determine the Tuesday or Wednesday drop date? So are you taking it on like Friday? Are you taking it on Monday? How does that work like logistically? Right. Yeah, the, the issue really is, is when you when you send it to the, the drop zone USPS, you can't ever accurately determine because it, it depends on how long USPS takes to send to their SCF centers, to their <laughs> local centers. Uh, we found that it depends on the territory. So when we send out mail, we actually will, like, here's an example, when we mail to New York, we actually print it three days before everyone else's because it takes an extra three days in transit to hit Tuesday or Wednesday. Gotcha. So you have to, over time, you'll have to, and by the way, we also have um, something I didn't mention that will make this make sense. 
is we have scan tracking technology. So when we mail through USPS, we, we get notification for every single mail piece of where it's locally at. Wow. And so we can track if something, let's say it hits mailboxes on Thursday, two months in a row, then we know, okay, we need to actually move this up one day when we initially send it out. So we're tracking every single mail piece when it's hitting those uh, main distribution centers. That's how we can track and adjust over time. Got some questions on the market opportunity uh, report from Chris and a few others. And, you know, every region has their own My Regional Gateway. That's where ours is in the Southeast region. Um, so I'm pretty sure that there's some, some tool like that available in most regions. Uh, some have said, like Alan said, I'm not sure it's being updated frequently. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that, that every region kind of has their own way of doing that, something that you can definitely research, uh, the market opportunity report. Um, what do you think about, so let me ask you, so Alan asked a question about robo agent. Yeah. So how do you come up with the numbers that you put on there? Do you use quote burst or robo agent or something, or is it just like a formula using Excel to kind of ballpark it based on a range? Yeah, we, um, so we'll definitely recommend quote burst robo agent. That makes it simple, right? Where you can just run it through their programs. One of your issues that you're going to run into is the fact that the teaser might not be enough of a teaser to get them to call, right? Especially in low premium states. If you're in a high premium state, it becomes a lot easier because there's a lot more wiggle room. Uh, so the third option that we work with agents on is we say, hey, send us the best quotes possible that you've done in these uh, square foot ranges. And then we backward work math to come up with an Excel formula to come up with what pricing and coverages it should show off their Excel spreadsheet. Gotcha. Now, yeah. someone asked a question, do you only do, so Haney asked, do you only do home quotes or do you also include auto quotes? What, how are you targeting it? So what we've found through my, my experience, so this is me talking, that auto insurance does not work. Um, the contact rate isn't high enough. And if you do go out, so as an example, um, the company I own, Agency MVP, we have direct vendor relationships with the Texas DMV. So I have every single vehicle possible and every driver's license possible in Texas. Even having that information, I still tried to mail out auto insurance mailers with the exact registration, so I knew what vehicles they had that were real, I still had a low enough contact rate to make it not viable, right? And I really believe it's because um, the teaser, I couldn't make the teaser look well enough, or maybe it's because auto insurance is so overly uh, commod commoditized, I can't use that word. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's, 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 there's too many commercials about auto insurance. And I just don't think it worked as well as it should have. I could have done it wrong. So if, if you guys have found a better way to do auto insurance quoting through direct mail, more power to you. I just couldn't make it work. A uh, similar follow-up question. What about the value of the homes? Is that pulled from Sales Genie? And then another question someone asked, have you ever tried coal, for example, and kind of compared Sales Genie is just better for you? So it's kind of two questions in one for the values and then maybe the coal for data. Cause we also get a great deal on coal X mm -hmm. dates. Yeah. So coal X dates, the one, um, the one problem there is they don't have the ability to use an X date. So if you don't want to, you, they do, but it's in a different format. So you can't filter a list and include the X date in the same filters. It's a different list that you have to pull. Um, so if you're really good at Excel, you could figure that out and how to append the data through their prospect or IQ, pull that list with filters and then pull their other list with X dating lists and then append the data. For the same reason, I would much rather just use Sales Genie because it's all in the same list. Uh, so you can use either one, but what most people don't know is they all get their data from the same company Axiom. So Axiom is the reseller of data for most of these huge companies. You can't buy directly from them. They give licenses to these other companies like Sales Genie and Cole that, um, so Cole can't have, I've asked them a million times, they can't download a list with X dates and filters at the same time because Sales Genie own, owns those rights. 
Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now I've got several questions about mm -hmm. contact rates. So what can you expect as a contact rate, a half a percent, maybe a bit more? Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm definitely not like the other mail vendors. I will not tell you, Hey, you're going to get one to 2%. Like, uh, no, I live in the trenches with you. Okay. What I will tell you is it's regional based. So for example, if you're in an area that has heavy fluctuations of rates in houses, Florida, uh, Texas, anywhere that has a lot of weather related claims. So you're going to have huge fluctuations in rate. Your contact rate is going to be higher because most people are going to be shopping for insurance more frequently. Right? So I would say it's regional based. We've had some insane contact rates in Florida, like one and a half percent, which is unheard of. Wow. Uh, I don't know why they got that. I'm jealous. Um, and we've gotten some really terrible contact rates in like Washington of 0.25%, right? So what we're doing differently is we release, we relax filters and say Washington to get the contact rate up. Um, and you might make them more strict in places like Florida because you can, right? So I would say on average, it's a half percent. Okay. Um, got some questions on the picture of the home. Somebody asked, is that included in the price? Um, I'll also add, what if that data is not readily available? So do you do like a mock, like example house? So can you talk a moment about that? Sure. Um, so what we do is if the house is not available on Google, then it will say, please do not bend in red instead of the home. Okay. Right. Uh, that usually happens, especially in Florida or anywhere that has a lot of homeowners associations where the Google car couldn't drive in there. It will say, please do not bend in red. And then, yeah, it's all turnkey pricing. So everything is included in that price. Um, so a couple more questions where we've got some really great questions here. Um, oh, some people have asked about zip code exclusivity. Do you work with one or two agents at a time? If you're working with multiple agents in the zip code, can you split the list? We have several people asking about exclusivity, Laura, Frank, and others. Yeah, so every letter that we send out is exclusive to the agent and the zip code that they're in, right? So it, that's why if you are interested and you are gonna send bulk, you, you should get in while it's hot, right? Um, I'm not trying to pressure sell anybody here. Uh, but once, once, you, once those zip codes are taken up for the letter, then it's not available and then you go on a waiting list and we'll let you know when it becomes available. Okay. Um, how much do you spend on mailers a month and how many do you send out a month? Roland wants to know, I guess, for your own agency. And you've built your book, a very big mega, it's a mega sized book. There's not a lot of farmers agents that get to that size. Um, mainly on direct mail. So do you mind sharing some data like for your own team? No, not at all. So our, right now our, our average closing ratio, and again, it's company based, right? So we will send out anywhere from 20, 25,000 mail pieces a month. And we're closing right now about 25% versus the average farmer's agent in my area has a 12% close rate. <clears throat> so the reason is, is while everybody is diving into internet leads and don't get me wrong we still use internet leads we still use life transfers but i use those to fulfill a quota for each agent and our producer within my office lsp whatever you want to call them um so if my direct mail you know if our contact rate is 0.4 percent one month i might buy a couple of extra leads and other sources but our our average closing ratio is so much higher because of the filters we use and the in, the consumer intent when they call us they are really interested in listening to what we have to say, right? So it makes it a lot easier to close a lot more business using this direct mail than any other lead source that there is. Um, a few team members, I mean, a few owners, David and Emily asked about follow-up calls. Do you proactively call out to the list? David said he's found that to be helpful. Emily asked, is it worth it to call? Um, yeah. What do you do? Uh, We, we do not, so my telemarketers, and I have two contact managers, they won't call the leads list specifically saying we sent you a mailer because what we found is when we did that, it, it, it ruined the conversation uh, up front because most of the people that see your mail piece, 
they're not going to remember you sent it. So we found that that talk path wasn't a good one for our telemarketing team, but we will call a week after our X date biannual X date list. We call on it, hoping that they're shopping at that time, right? So where we don't call it saying, Hey, we sent you a mail piece. We still do call it just for natural telemarketing in house. Okay. Uh, Chris asked a question about sales genie. Are, are we supposed to generate the list and then send to you or do you like go into our sales genie and do it? Uh, Chris was asking. Yeah. To get the discount, um, our, our, my admin assist, uh, Brittany, she's going to work with the agents and get login information. And she goes in, builds it with you initially. And then she goes in each month and downloads the list. And we do that to keep agents. We tried to do it the other way. Um, but agents would keep changing their zip codes and infringing on other agents. And it, so we have to control that in house. And that that's why we give that two cent discount off is, uh, is we go in and we download the list and you can see a history of what we download, how many we download, if there's ever a question of, of integrity. Uh, Mark asked if you're mailing thousands of pieces a month, three, five, 10, or even 20,000, do you send them all the same day or do you space them evenly throughout the month? And I'm looking at your pricing there. It says bi-monthly drops. Do you ever do weekly if somebody wants to go more than that? And then someone also asked on a smaller volume, say 3,000, could it be split over 750 weekly? I think maybe these people are afraid of getting too many calls at once. So what are your thoughts on frequency of drops and volume of drops? Yeah, something I didn't mention. So um, one of the filters on Sales Genie that you can use is the home purchase date. So what we do is we take that home purchase date, which is the day they bought the house of that month, and we split it into two drops. We take the people that bought the house between the 1st and the 15th, and we drop it the week before the month, the X date month. So 45 days out, we're hitting the first wave of people that are going to get their renewal notices. And then in the middle of the month, we do the people from the 15th to possibly the 31st, and we hit them on the second week of the month because now we're hitting those people when they start to get their renewal notices. So we're really strategic around using the filters to hit the people when they should be hit. Now, any more than a bi-monthly drop, I don't think it will impact uh, too much the contact rate, but what it really does impact on my end is the shipping rate, uh -huh. right? So if we do shipping every single week, then your costs have to go up because the cost of from our mail house to the USPS, you're paying FedEx in between, right? So in order to keep costs at where they're at, we can't do any more than a single drop or a bi-monthly drop. Now there is an option. We will allow people to split up the under 6,000 to two drops, but we charge you an extra surcharge based on that FedEx shipping. Um, Jeremy asks, since you're using bulk mail rates, how are you using a real stamp on the envelope? Is that something that the mail house does? It's a secret. It's a secret? It's a secret. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not a real stamp. It uh, looks real. It just looks like it. It looks That's real. Right. So it's the barcode underneath the address is the trick, right? Uh, you are correct, sir. Uh, see, I've been, I've been trying to learn a little from mm -hmm. you since we've been networking with you. Uh, Rick asked about Florida since we are a majority of brokered home, you know, what do Florida agents do? You know, is it still a smart strategy if you're in an area where you have to broke it to leave with home? They are, they are loving it. Right. Yeah. So you uh, leave it home and then you get the cars and the umbrella and the boats and the golf carts and the life insurance you leave with home. Yep. Um, and you're, you're, you're at an advantage because you have 10 or 12 companies to quote through. I only got one. That's right. One good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I was an agent in Florida, I am jealous that they get to broker homes. Yeah. I would be blowing it up. Absolutely. Um, Rondell and so Rondell asked about, you know, we're in car, we're encouraged to market in our local area. What are your thoughts about going around the whole state? And then someone else asked a question about why it's important to use a local phone number. Dylan asked, why is it important to use a local number? So can you talk about wider nets and local phone numbers again? Sure. So I, I think we're freezing up here. Okay. Can you see me? All right. So, I, yeah, you're good. Um, so it's really important to not be a victim of your territory. And, and 
and I say that a lot to people in rural markets where they don't have a lot of people to mail to, uh, but they might live 100 miles away from a huge city, the entire state if you wanted to, is because if you appear local, people are going to call the phone number. What we've researched is about 30% of the time, real, real numbers, I think last month were 32%, 32% of all the people from my direct mail campaign search for my name on Google. Okay. So what that means is they're trying to identify if I'm local or not. But the other 70% of the time, they just called me. So they called me though, because my area code appeared local to them. If you have, if you're in, my example would be 214 is a Dallas area code and 512 is an Austin area code. If I mailed out 512 area codes to everybody in Dallas, they're going to look at it and just not pay it the same attention as feeling like, oh, this guy's local. Does that make sense? Yes. And you want to appear local by using that local phone phone number. Right. Um, and in our mail piece, um, it's not on this one. It's on our new one that we have. It says your local agent, right? With that area code in bold. So we definitely make it look like you're a local uh, agent. And what we found is because they call you, even if you're not local, you can still then with through talk paths and things like that, explain that there's no difference unless you just like coming in for coffee every single day. Uh, there's no difference. And got a question on compliance here. Tim asked and someone else asked and gang, I think we have enough questions to round us out in the next nine minutes. And I bet if you have a question, it's already been asked. So I'd like to try to fly through them. Uh, but Tim asked and someone else just asked about compliance joy about scrubbing the do not solicit. So you would want us as the agent to download the list or you get the list right through yep. that and make it easy. We would of course need to scrub to remove do not solicits and right. I would remove current customers. Um, so yes, great questions. I'm glad that y'all asked. Compliance is very important. Definitely. Um, so thank y'all for bringing that up. Yeah, we, we download the leads list. We have you scrub it and then just send it back to us or you scrub it, run it through a robo agent or quote burst and then send it back to us and then we mail out. Um, so I'm going to try to fly through some of these. Joe asked about, you know, timing. If they're a December home buyer, I've been dropping the month before through the mid month. Um, I think I'm dropping too early or am I dropping too late? So let's say I'm renewing December 15th. Let's just throw that out there. When should we hit me? as a consumer we're going to hit you the the first week if you're on the, uh, the the last week of the month before if you are the 16th you're we're going to hit you the first or second week of the week before so you're about two to three weeks or so around the renewal date before right. so they've already gotten the renewal could have even potentially paid their renewal or maybe the mortgage company is about to pay the renewal you're trying to hit it within that two three week time frame well, before, the month before. Oh, the month before. So maybe it's right. like five or six weeks before. Because they'll get their renewal notice 45 days before. You want to be we're around? Trying to, we're trying to hit right when they get their renewal notice. Understood. Randy asked about return on investment. You know, what's a realistic time frame to get your money back on direct mail? One year, 18 months, et cetera. I'll chime in since, Todd, you might not be very aware of things. But guys, BYB. Broaden your book can fund so much. A hundred, if you're in an area that has home, a hundred dollars a home, thirty dollars a line ten, a standard auto, twenty dollars for other SPLs. You get a household, you get a hundred and eighty dollar bonus plus the commissions on it, plus the annual bonus on it, plus the renewals on it for seven point four years. You can potentially make money with BYB before the first renewal. But why don't you talk about Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't look at it necessarily as how do I make my money back? I mean, the, the acquisition cost is acquisition cost. You know, the fact that they're going to stay around for over seven years, if you're trying to scale your agency, you know, don't worry so much about the first year or the second year, maybe even the third year. You've got several years there that you're going to make money on. So, you know, I don't, I don't really focus on that much, that, that part of it. We look at an acquisition cost, if we can get it at 125 hundred dollars, something like that, an item without BYB, without any bonuses, without any other in incentives, we can make that work. When you factor in the other things, it's just a no brainer. So um, I wouldn't worry so much about the first year. I'd, I'd concentrate more on let's scale this thing out. Let's grow this book as, as fast as we can get, as big as we can get there. And, and let's worry about what's going to happen with those renewals later on down the road. Um, so Brian asked, you wouldn't want to include references to your carrier, right? right. So yeah, just, just run in real fast. 
Wait, sorry, it, it's, Zoom kind of froze up. That's okay. You're good. Oh, I was just going to throw out that my, my ROI is 18 months, seven years. So. Okay. Uh, Brian says, I would assume you wouldn't refer to your carrier. You want to keep it generic and just brand your agency on these types of letters, probably for compliance purposes and other things, right? Yes. That's exactly right. We, we try to get you to use a business email. Um, we were you can create a business domain email and we uh, using logos. Um, Jason asks if there's a way to filter out town yeah. class code. Hello? Oh, I think we're on a bit of a delay here, Todd. I'm not sure if it's on your end or my end. Um, I apologize. Now? So Jason okay. is asking if there's a filter for town class codes. My market is very heavy in high town classes, which means it's less competitive. Is there a way to filter for town class in Sales Genie or no? I haven't seen one. Gotcha. So, so I guess you should kind of know, you kind of know the zip codes right. that are kind of out there or like more rural. So they're way further away from fire departments and things like that. And Brian asked, you know, for example, it seems that a lot of people that we, that call in are senior citizens, you know, they don't really get our best rates. What are we doing wrong? Well, maybe Brian, um, eliminate, you know, using age, age as a filter, mm -hmm. uh, within sales genie. Um, to hit your sweet spots, you know, the 35 to 60 or 35 to 55 type market. Um, something to think about. Joseph asks, is there a three month commitment? I'll do it once or when we drop. So Joseph is asking a billing question. Um, yeah. It's a three month commitment, but we invoice you monthly. Okay. What about condos? Some people asked about condos. Rhonda and someone else did. Do you have is there a way to filter out condos that include unit numbers? Condos count for, just as far I taught for us as much as homes do in terms of points. So a lot yeah. of people want to target condos, but it might be hard to do. It's very hard to do. We're working with a couple of large all state agents right now to come up with a condo piece that works well enough. So we are in the midst of making one right now. Okay, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but some some states are moving to Advisor Pro, which is different than Alliance. Um, I'm, I've been told that Advisor Pro will still work with things like Quote Burst and Robo Agent. Lee asked about that. I've been told that you're still going to be able to run quotes through Quote Burst and Robo Agent, but if not, if things change, you could always use an Excel formula, right. like he talked right. about, kind of using Excel form formula. Uh, Judd wants to know from us what our breakdown is on spend on leads is right now for us. I can take that if you want. Right. So <clears throat> right now we're spending probably about 12000 or so on direct mail and writing um, uh, probably about $150 an item <clears throat> on that. So we're trying to stay within that target. We don't do any data leads whatsoever. That's just a waste of our time. Uh, we are doing some live transfers, which we've talked about before in our webinars, um, particularly those that use EA funds, all state money, right? Uh, but we've done, you know, outside EA funds too, but live transfers are very expensive, but at least you're talking to them compared to a data lead. Uh, so we're, we've spent more money on marketing this year than we ever have. <laughs> Thanks to those big, beautiful grids, yep. right? Those big, beautiful grids. Um, and we got a quarter left to try to finish strong. Uh, but we're spending a fair amount on marketing. We do a lot of requotes and winbacks, yeah. cross yep. sales, referrals, COIs. So this stuff just supplements Ice. what we're already doing. Uh, Dennis asked a good question. What about hitting them more than once, like 45 days later? Or are you just trying to hit them like every six months? Yeah, there's, I've tried it multiple different ways. And what I've found is, is the X date month right before, so 45 days before, has a hair of a better contact rate. Uh, most shoppers are going to shop when they get your mail piece. Okay. So I, I've heard of many people saying, hey, I mail the same person three months in a row, whatever the case may be. I've noticed that there is a slight advantage at doing it how we're doing it. Um, but I would tell you if you mail them 45 days after, you're still gonna get some contact rate. It's just not gonna be as high as I've found doing it 45 days before. 
Um, Nathan asked, do you always find it's best to put a sample quote on there since we're, yeah, it's all about price then. Uh, condos are worth a lot to us. Would you send a rate quote to a condo? So we kind of answer condo, but you say you need to always put a price on there because that's what's sexy. That's what's going to drive the cost. Yes. It is the reason for the mail piece. If you just try to say, hey, save 50 bucks or save 20% with me, it will not work. I'm going to fly through some of these questions. If someone signs up with you, Brandon wants to know, how long is it until the first drop? Is it a few weeks, a month? Like, what's the setup time? And by the way, you're probably about to be slammed, so get ready. <laughs> so, um, um, Brandon asked that. Yeah, we, we build out, uh, like, our next mail drop's going out on the 21st of next month. So we have about a two-week window where we get people in. We build out their proof, get their list together. So I'd say there's, you know, a two- to three-week um, admin on our side, but we work with them and, and get them up for the next mail campaign or they can jump in mid month next month. So, I mean, there's, uh, it's a two or three month lag based on admin work. We have to do up front. Once you're all set up, then it's, then it's really simple. And by the way, it's turnkey. So we do everything. Nice. <laughs> uh, Philip asked if I have multiple agencies, can I list multiple agencies on a mailer or should I, or should I do some from each agency? Does that impact the cost? Absolutely. It does not impact cost, but we will help you do that if there's enough volume. So we will build different profiles for you so that each mailer has the address of your local agency and give you multiple profiles. So that way each mailer is local feeling around your agency. Again, it, you need to have at least 3000 mail pieces uh, for us to do that. Um, let's see here. Um, how do you overcome the objection of saying, you know, your office isn't local, but the phone number is. If somebody figured that out, if they saw it, how would you overcome that you're not local? How, how would you overcome that at your agency, Todd? I'm not, I'm not going to lie. We've never gotten that response. Um, and I think it's because they're calling us and we're not even talking about what my address is. Does that make sense? So when we're talking to them and we're building rapport with them and we're sending and going over the quote with them over the phone and we close them, we don't get, wait a minute, you're not in Austin or you're not in, right? So it doesn't come up um, because the people who are going to search you on Google, maybe those 30% of people that, that didn't call me because they found out through research that I wasn't actually local because the area code was different. Does that make sense? So it's never even coming up. It might be something that you guys uh, want to build a video on for talk paths, but we would really just say something to the effect of, well, I'm talking to you right now. If we need to get on a web chat, you know, if you want to come sit, sit in front of me, we can do it right here on, uh, on your phone if you want to, right? Let's, let's do a FaceTime call um, to make it feel local. Yeah. Uh, Rick just sent a chat saying quote burst doesn't work with broker companies. Of course it doesn't quote burst, you right. know, and EQS work with Allstate Alliance. So again, if you're in an area where you have to broker, you would just use an Excel formula that they could help you guys uh, with a couple questions. Alan wants to know, can I buy the software and get those home picks on the envelopes for the mailers? Or was that like really expensive? Or he just it's asked a about insanely expensive uh, program. So our, we run it, I use a, a third party vendor to do it for us because it's too expensive. I think it was like a hundred grand the last time I looked at it. Wow. So you just pay wow. them a couple cents a piece or something or right. a name. Uh, Jeremy asks, what if I have current bulk permits? Can you use that? Or do you need to use your own bulk permit numbers or does it matter? Uh, it would be too complex to try to go through. So it's turnkey, our pricing, how it is. All right. A couple more questions here. Linda uh, says, our community is getting a lot of non-renewal notices in our area from other carriers where she is over in California where the terrible fires were. They're getting, yeah. there's lots of non-renewals. Can you market specifically for that? Maybe do a piece on getting not renewed, call us, or can you do more custom things? Yeah, if the, if the, for custom one-off mailers, you have to have 25,000. Okay. But for, for agents who want to send out some huge bulk mail, we have uh, agents who send out 100,000 mail pieces. We will customize something specifically for their agency if that's what they want. Uh, David asked, do your prospects ever ask to visit the office? Or are they comfortable closing over the phone? David, I'll answer that. We write six, seven, eight hundred items a month. I bet 5% of them are in person. Yeah. <laughs> 95%. It's all over the phone these days. Yeah. It's going to come up some from time to time. Sure. Not a big deal. Often, some people will come in after the fact just mm -hmm. to shake their hand yeah. or to maybe bring their T-Docs back to sign. 
Um, Shane, no worries, Shane, we're good. Let's see here. Do you find that certain times of year have greater contact rates, Archer wants to know, or if you're doing it pretty consistent, will you have pretty consistent results? You know, we found that people hang on to their letter, right? So your, your initial contact rate is going to hover between a half a percent, 0.75, 1% if you're lucky, uh, depending on what's going on in rate environments, rate increases in your area. But what we found is, you know, your, your holiday, that's why we, we do move our drop dates in November and December, because we don't want to hit mailboxes when it's full of junk. So we're pretty strategic, but I'd be lying if I said that contact rates don't fluctuate. So November, December, you'll have a little drop off, but then January, all those people you mailed to start really flowing in. So January has a huge contact rate but a lot of the contact rate came from people holding on to the mail piece. Um, what is your average closing percentage? Haney asked, you said it was about 25% on your mailers. The average agent in your area is about 12%. So what's cool is when people are calling off a direct mail, they're calling you on their time. On their time. They set aside time to call you a live transfer. They might agree to talk to you, but it wasn't on their time. Mm -hmm. You're, prospect your agents are outbound calling they're catching them when they're off guard so that's what's cool about direct mail is they set aside time to call and talk to your agency and that's why they cost a lot to do but they're worth it and have a higher return on investment archer said a lot of agents are mailing in my area do you think that also creates mail fatigue interesting no. question. because they're mailing this they're mailing that <laughs> junk <laughs> Todd, you're hilarious. Uh, last question, gang, and we went a bit over, but that's okay. Hopefully, this is very impactful for you yeah, guys. Yeah, um, Real quick, uh, Lori said, what about after hours? Like, what if they call the agency and CCC writes it and we don't get as much commission? Well, uh -oh. that's why you wouldn't use your main agency number, Lori. You'd want to use a sales number, uh, which is approved. It's approved to have a separate phone number that you use for marketing pieces, and your VoIP provider can help you with that. But you wouldn't want to use your main number on marketing pieces like this, which, by the way, again, is a proof. It's okay to have a separate marketing number. Even agencies on IS are allowed to have a second marketing number that doesn't read, I mean, ring to the company. So, yeah, do not use your main number on these, right, Todd? You want to use a separate number so you can track it and make That's sure right. that you get the voicemails and data. That's exactly right. That's right. What is he feeling about the drip campaigns like State Farm uses? I guess, I mean, does State Farm similar or is it a little different or does is it just as corporate -y? I mean, I don't uh, know. I had a, a State Farm mail piece. They stopped, in my area, they stopped using teaser rates. So I'm sure their agents are hating life right now. <laughs> this is their mail piece. No call to action other than this red line that says, says uh, save an average of 854 on home and auto. That's very corporate-y. Yep. Oh, my God. Corporate-y. Uh, um, last, yeah. last question. Chris says, do these open at a higher rate or comparable rate to pressure seal envelopes? I don't know what that is. Snap mail. So he's talking about snap pack mailers. Uh -huh. your, your problem with snap pack mail is that it's overused by warranty companies and fake checks. So that's your mail fatigue. It got, it, it, that, that used to work, but it doesn't anymore as effective. And last question that just popped up real quick before I pass it to Craig to wrap up is, you know, how do you train your customers to use your real number after they've used your marketing number? It's like, you just train them, you know, when you call the customers back and handle them or whatever, let them know the main number to get 24 seven, 365 access is whatever, maybe send them an email, send them a contact card so they can save it to their phone. Um, but it's okay. Them calling all your agency is a good thing. All their documents, all the documents they get are going to have your Correct. agency number on the stuff they get from the company. Deal, so. right? All right. Well, Hey Todd, thanks so much. You know, yeah. I hope you guys found this informative, mm -hmm. um, very educational. You know, Todd's got a lot of experience with this and he's working with a lot of folks. So I appreciate you jumping on here and spending some time with us today. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to reach out to him directly, reach out to one of us and, and we'll help you any way that we can. But I think direct mail is definitely a fantastic tool. and People need to start thinking about that more and more if they're not already. So thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you being appreciate on the call that. today. We'll talk to you soon.